Did you have good, a good Thanksgiving this year? Get together with family. Had, had, a, had a good time. I trust that you remember to thank God. He's the one who showers us with so many blessings. Um, Thanksgiving originated back, uh, of course, we've heard the pilgrim story. But how did we get the, uh, the, the day when we're all getting together? I think it's the fourth uh, Thursday of the month, right? Of November, is it? Oh, yeah, right. That's, that's what it is. How did that ever come to be? Well, really what happened is we had a very good president, George Washington. Do you know we've had good presidents? <laughs> and uh, this particular president, George Washington, decided uh, after uh, the struggle with gaining their independence that, and the Lord had blessed us, we became a nation, and here we are, uh, Seems like we've got a bright hope and a future ahead of us. He thought it would be good if the whole country would celebrate together a day of thanksgiving to the one who made it possible. In those days, uh, God was still the center of government and uh, the local family and the community. Sure, we had freedom to have different denominations and even other religions uh, in America. But still, it was a God-centric society in time. And we had a, a godly president. I had a chance to, to go up to visit his uh, place where he lived and went with my wife. And it was, it was interesting to hear about his faith. He had a Bible. He read it. He prayed uh, fervently. And, and this... George Washington made a decree to the whole nation on October 3 in 1789 that we should have a day set aside for thanking God. But we also have had another, who's the most, uh, the other great president we've had? Lincoln. Lincoln was the other guy. Of course, he had, a, he had an easy uh, task when he came into office, right? Some people whine as if they've got it the worst. But do you know what? I never heard about the previous president when uh, Lincoln didn't come into office. He literally got up there and, and uh, he established a focus. Even though he was living in severe times, the country was being split in two. It, there, was, there was no unity. But this man focused his attention on God. And humbled him, his heart before God and called on the nation to not just have a day that at the will of a president we would maybe have a Thanksgiving or not have a Thanksgiving. He decided it would be good for our country to establish a day forever, a holiday where we would celebrate every year and set aside and acknowledge our maker who is the source of every good and perfect gift. And so in 1863, President Lincoln issued a proclamation making Thanksgiving an official holiday. We who have been blessed with God's blessing shouldn't need a uh, decree from a president or a holiday to go to God and offer thanks. We're the church of Jesus Christ. Our king has been doing things that have gotten us up off, off of our seat and clapping for him on a regular basis. All those who follow him and see his goodness. Oh, thankfulness should be our language. As much as pray, uh, faith, and faith is a language, uh, is praise is a language of faith, thankfulness is also a language of faith. It says in Psalm 118, I love this picture here. An old wise man. Looked like he's lived a few years. It says this in Psalm 118 verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And when I see that picture I, I'm, I'm reminded that we've had ancestors. I've had a mother and a father who have modeled this devotion in going to God in thanks. I tell you what. 
from generation to generation. May it be so. Also, it says in Psalm 92, verse 1, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. It may be good to give thanks, but is it a steady stream from our mouths? Praise and thanksgiving to God. Or is it something that we need to be kicked in the shins or reminded, oh yeah, we should thank God. We've got thanksgiving. Oh, we're in church. We should, we should probably praise the Lord. That's right. I'll tell you what, thankfulness is, is something that has to come from deep inside of you. If you try to have it just memorized, say please and thank you, say please and thank you, not only... Will it not accomplish or does it sound insincere when someone nods you, nudges you and say, say thank you to them, the little kids. You ever do that to your kids? Say, say thank you. As they're, oh, yeah, they're all excited about what they got there and they're totally ignoring. Oh yeah, thank you. you know? It sounds insincere. But when someone truly who has been received a gift that just brings them to a place of their only response is thank you, thank you, thank you. It's sincere and it has meaning. God wants us to give sincere thanks. How many of you clapped for your, uh, fam your, the one who prepared the meal on Thanksgiving? How many of you thanked at least? Okay. For the rest of us, and it doesn't matter, just because just you didn't raise your hand doesn't mean you do, didn't do it. I know that. But just in case, we're going to do a round of applause for all those who prepared food on Thanksgiving. Right? Giving thanks blesses those who serve, go out of their way to, to put the effort into it. But not only does it bless them, but it also blesses the heart of God who loves to see someone plant seed and reap a harvest. The reason why you're, you know, those who have cooked the meals is because they want to see you enjoy it. And the reason why God blesses us is not just because he wants to have us clap it's because he wants us to have our our joy full and so we we need to develop a heart of thanksgiving um, we sing in church that's that's the church right there Psalm 95 verse 2 come let us come before his presence with thanksgiving let us shout joyfully to him uh, that is, shouldn't be just a, a church thing it should be something that goes on as you walk out the door. It should not be far below the surface in your homes. True, a heart of thanksgiving isn't activated when you walk into a church building. A heart of thanksgiving is a low boil inside of you. A recognition of how much we have been blessed. I, I have an advantage in, in praise and thanksgiving because the Bible says those who have been forgiven much love much some of you might be real have been really goody two-shoes all your life and never stepped outside the lines I wasn't one of those guys I was someone who had planted seeds which I did not want to harvest but when God came into my life he not only covered my sin with his precious blood, but he actually has been removing the seeds that would have grown up and bring despair and discouragement and death in my life. He has wiped out. He's walked in back of me and expunged some of the consequences that I should have. And I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty thankful. When I, when I see, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm getting away with things when, when blessing happens to me. I go like, whoa, blessing again. Wow. No one move. Don't, don't, don't draw attention to the fact I'm getting blessed so much because I know what I deserved. The Bible says that's one of the few advantages of a person who has walked outside. And believe me, there are not many advantages to having have had a past that uh, you had to be ashamed of. And that is, those who've been forgiven much, love much. And for that, I am grateful. All right? Um, today, I want us to examine 
ourselves to see if the fruit of our lips pours forth life or some other kind of flow comes out of it? Could it be the sewage of complaining, the sewage of, of grumbling? Because grumbling is the opposite of thankfulness. Uh, in this self, here, here the, in fact, the Psalm 19 verse 14 encourages us with this prayer to say, God, let it be. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, what I think about, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my rock, my redeemer. If the self-evaluation of looking inside yourself to see, am I really a person who's thankful? If that reveals to you some weakness in thankfulness, God want, doesn't want to condemn you today. But he does want to point out what are some of the flaws, the break in the line between what God intends for you to come out and what is the stoppage in your life. And so we're going to explore that a little bit. I actually entitled the message of today, The Headwaters of Thankfulness. Besides sounding cool, it is a profound uh, illustration that keeps on coming up and again, again and again in Scripture. This picture of, of God, God's power, God's supply flowing through us like water. All right? Let's look at the definition of headwater. Headwater is the place where something begins, where it springs into being. Thankfulness is not just something that you do. It's more what you see. I like to draw. I'm an artist. And at times I'll show up at someone's house and say to the young kids, because I, get, I identify with young people quite a bit because it's my mentality, I think. But uh, I say, you got any pencil and paper? You know, you know. Sure, and they give me a pencil and paper, and I'll draw pictures and, and things like that. I, I actually have been going lately into uh, some of the classrooms at Triunity and, and walking in there and giving impromptu art lessons and gives the teacher a break, and, and I'm, I'm a hero to the teacher, and the kids, you know, they, they give, they're, they're just awestruck, you know, this is great. I can learn how to, you mean I can learn how to do this? But one of the first things I teach them is... When you draw, it's not because you know how to move the pencil so perfectly. You have such con con good control of the pencil that gives you the ability to draw. It is more in what you see. And so I try to say, stop. It's got to come from here. It's got to come from what you see. Your hand may not be able to do it perfectly, but if you see it, then you can at least have a shot at making it look like it. Any, any would-be artists here? Any kids who like to draw here or older people? Put your hand up. It's not, it's just because you can't make a good living at it doesn't mean you can't be proud of doing it, you know. <laughs> it, it's great. An artist needs to, the reason, for him to be able to draw is he needs to be able to see. And in the same way, thankfulness is not about you trying to get all your words exactly right and be quick on the draw to say thankful. Because it can be contrived and, and, and put on and stiff and not believable. But if it springs from your heart, it's sincere. Even though the words might be clumsy, they hear your heart. It says that um, what we say is an indicator of our hearts. The words we say. Are you aware of that? Well, I can end up uh, spending some time with any one of you for a little bit and listen to your conversation, see the way you talk about life, and I can start to see a little bit of what you might be the core that you live out of, what m makes you tick. It says in Proverbs 4, verse 23, because of this, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Here is these, this pictorial, this analogy of water springing up out of you. You can see a person's invisible parts, 
his heart by what pours out of him. They say that up to 80% of what we communicate is nonverbal. And uh, I'll give you an example of this. I'm going to show you some faces. Now, I tried to find a really good looking model uh, to, to pose, but it was like midnight last night. So you're just going to have to live with who it is. Uh, <laughs> what is this? face communicate anger okay so you're, you're you're somehow looking into my soul right there well okay that can say anger what does this face communicate that's apathy well okay if it is supposed to you know yeah that was a pretty good turkey uh, yeah yeah come see come see whatever you know <laughs> I tell you what that is not Someone tapped into a wellspring of life. Someone looks like more like someone who's caught in a well and he's been sitting there for years. Well, this is life. Well, whatever. Next one. What about that? What's a face like besides needing a shave and a good mug shot? Pride? Yeah, in some ways, pride, yeah. What else does that say to you? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Stubbornness. Yeah, okay, it's good for you. It doesn't mean necessarily me. And I tell you what, I tell you what, I, I, I'm only going to go about so far. You know what, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I don't want to be here. You know? You ever talk to people like that? They didn't want to be there and they let it know real... They never said they didn't want to be there, but their face said they didn't want to be there. Well, what does this one say? I'm going to go to bed pretty quick. <laughs> no. What does it say? Peace. There's a happy man there. A happy man. What about that? <laughs> That's thankful Kelvin style. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, some people think that's contrived, but <laughs> you live with me a little bit and you've seen that happy face. I do the happy dance too, you know. Yeah. Our words and demeanor reveal what we believe. Are you representing what you believe very well? Are you representing well? Or are you given a misrepresentation of what life has for you and who you serve? Remember, we parents are training our children. Make sure that they graduate with a degree in gratitude. You need to make sure that when they leave the house, Lord, may it be. No, not really. Uh, when they eventually leave, they have a degree, an understanding. They've learned the lessons of gratitude. It, it's, it's good that you just graduated from nursing school. Yes, Allison. Good job. I know some other people who don't have never studied and have a degree in that. They actually, right, they went through high school and they went, whoa, I made it! Right, Nate? Right. <laughs> and Phil, I made it! I'm free! The promised land! Give me a... F and you went right out into the workforce and started making a living. You know, your parents are just glad... That, that, that you're going on with your life and it, it doesn't ma so much matter whether you got a degree or you're a doctor as my son's going to be or, or, just, or, or, or just a housewife just a it's wonderful raising my children uh, raising grandchildren my grandchildren that will be good I'm, I'm happy about that but what I don't want to have happen is to have my children leave and not learn and have a degree in gratitude. Because that will serve them well, whether you end up waiting and, and obeying the head nurse or doctor, or obeying the boss who, who has to obey, in some ways, the customer, right? But if you end up exhibiting gratitude, that will take you far. Can I have an amen from the parents? It says this, teach 
your children to say thank you often. Tell them to meditate on what is good. It says in Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, so that sort of thins down. You, you start with a big, big field. Whatever is true, well, okay, narrow it down to whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there be any excellency, and if anything worthy of praise, Dwell on these things. Think about this. Meditate. Bring that to mind. Let that sit in your craw instead of the fact that you are gypped. I'll tell you what. The way you actually put inside of a child gratitude is not by giving them everything. It will train them to expect. Train them. As our society has created a whole generation expecting to be taken care of it is their right God God offers life to us it is not our right it is a free gift it's something that we can receive and even in this country we are offered the privilege to the pursuit of happiness we are never guaranteed happiness entitlement will never bring us to a place of gratitude and quite often it's deprivation by depriving someone of immediate gratification will cause a person to be way more grateful I tell you what my parents um, they made me walk both uh, to school you know you know uphill both ways you've heard that you know stone in my pocket to keep me warm not not really uh, but they made they did not give us things they taught us that for one thing you do chores and after the chores are done, and you want to earn some extra money, they might be willing to give you a little extra money if you go well beyond your chores. All right? I've found that that has engendered in me gratefulness because I didn't expect that they were, that I was somehow deprived. And I, my, my friends at school got their allowance, you know, whether they did anything or not. Ah, I was so excited when my dad gave me a buck and said, here, don't spend it all in one place. You know, I was just, oh, my dad gave me a dollar. You know, gratefulness sometimes comes from have, having to work for something. Listen to this. Genetically, your children tend to look like you. How many have kids that look like them? But they also tend to look like you spiritually. Now, that's a sobering thought. If they seem ungrateful, before you start lecturing and disciplining them, go and check in a mirror to see if they're simply taken after their old man. That's a disrespectful word. But I tell you what, if you do not train your children right, disrespect is what you will get. Make sure that you live the way you want your children to, to live. And teach your children to be thankful, full of thanks. Teach them to be full of thanks and they'll thank you later. James 3, 10 through 18. Speaking of the mouth, what pours out of our heart. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. It should not be like this, my brothers. So he's speaking to the church. A spring cannot pour forth both fresh and brackish water from the same opening, can it? My brothers, a fig tree cannot produce olives nor a grape vine figs, can it? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water? When who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his model conduct that his actions are done humbly and wisely. But if you have bitter jealousies and rivalry in your hearts, which is the source of everything that comes out of our mouth and on our face, stop boasting and slandering the truth. The kind of wisdom, this kind of wisdom does not come from above. No, it is worldly, self-centered, and demonic. For wherever jealousy and rivalry, rivalry exists, there is disorder of every kind of evil. However, 
the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure, then peace loving and gentle, willing to yield, full of compassion and good deeds, and without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is grown from the seeds of peace planted by peacemakers. If you plant inside of your heart God's word and yield to that, what it will be a natural outcome, a crop of thanksgiving and praise. It's very important. The gallery of the world is judging all of us. It says in Matthew 7, 16 and 17 and also 20, you will know them by your fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. I put that in there. If you're grateful, you will express your thanks. Don't say that, you know what? I'm grateful, I just don't say it. I'm sorry. It says in verse 20, so then, you will know them by your fruits. Thankfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. And you say, wait a second. I've read the, the list in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Thankfulness is not a fruit of the Spirit. Come on, Calvin, get, get it right. Let's read what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, I do believe and I will argue that thankfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a hybrid fruit of the Spirit. It is a sweet combination of love and kindness and goodness. And it expresses itself, and you will recognize it by it's filled with love, filled with kindness, and it is goodness. It, the Bible says it is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is a fruit of the Spirit, sort of like a honey crisp. Well, I tell you what, honey crisp didn't just happen. There were people who thought, you know what, I really like this, the firmness of this particular apple here, and I like, you know, the, 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 the juiciness of this one here, and the sweetness and a little tartness. Mmm, I like that. We'll, we'll put them all together. We'll graft it onto, a, on, onto a one tree, and we'll work at it, and we'll develop a really cool fruit, all right? It's the combination, the hybrid is wonderful and thankfulness is one of the many hybrids of the fruits of the spirit they're the basic generic species you know variances of the fruit but god intends for us to mix and match them all together and express them as a fragrant offering the good news is if you do not have a lot of thankfulness in your heart fruit can be grown and god is a great gardener and because of that, there's hope for us. If you yield to God, He will care for you so that you will bear much fruit. It says in Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. I love this particular verse. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. You get that same picture of sucking the, the nourishment, its source, the headwaters as it were, tying into the headwaters. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bring forth fruit. Most of our lack of thankfulness comes as a result of not trusting in God. Blessed is the man who trusts in God. He has confidence in Him. I would dare say that if you have a heart and struggle with un, uh, not thankfulness, grumbling, you have a trust issue with God. You do not believe that God is able to take you and care for you. You, you, every one of us have plans. We have an agenda in our life. We have goals, at least if you're, you know, aside from, well, no, I won't go there. Most of us have goals. And these goals are, we have made steps. Maybe you've gone to school. Maybe you've, we have plans. Most, most humans have plans. And when, when these plans get thwarted, moved to the side, it challenges us. Do we believe God? Do we trust that He knows 
He knows us. He sees what's going on. And he loves us. If we do not have faith that God is sovereign, it will be frustrating and upsetting when cir the circumstances of life interrupt our schedule's goals. How many can relate to that? Your frustration comes from, I was planning on doing this the other day. <coughs> um, I was planning on going to bed earlier, not like 2 o'clock this morning. But, you know, the washing machine broke. Now, my plan was to fix that on Friday. Not for, yeah, yeah, Friday, all right? Um, but we, I had a hard time getting the part. I had ordered it earlier, but they didn't have it on the truck. So, so I had to fix it on Saturday. So I, I had plans. I thought it would go real smooth, but do you know what? It's amazing how these, these marks in my arm, it's, how, how do these repairmen do that, you know? I'm not, I'm not a real repairman, but I'm also cheap, you know. So I try to fix it myself. Uh, my, my plans were thwarted. Now, I had a couple choices to do. I'm teaching on thankfulness. Am I going to get upset? Or I'm going to go, wow, this is, this is the way things have been dealt to me today. So I will rejoice in the Lord. The Lord will give me what I need. I will not worry. I believe what the Bible says. My God is sovereign. He will give me the energy and the strength and, and the words. And so I was able to move forward. But if you keep getting frustrated and upset when your schedule and goals are challenged, and if you have tied your happiness to the fulfillment of your plans, if you do that, you are setting yourself up for disappointment. Disappointment, an amazing thing. It's, talk about an opposite of thankfulness. Disappointment. It didn't work out. In order to be content and thankful, our plan, plans are changed. When our plans are changed, we need to believe that God is in control. How many of you give mental assent, uh, assent to the fact that God is in control? Is God sovereign? Does he see you? But when we manifest anxiety and stress and put on faces like I had put up on earlier, when your plans are thwarted and obstacles happen, should people believe that we trust in God? It's, it isn't an easy sell. You are not believable. But if you... Continually remind yourself by focusing on God that all your, your life comes from Him and that He's for you. Then I tell you what, anything comes along, it's, that's just fine. I, I love this scripture verse right here. It says, and two of them here, Philippians, I know what it is to be, in the Apostle Paul speaking, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of contentment. In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And it goes on in Romans, it says, Romans 8 verse 28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who, are love, who love God, those who are called according to their own purposes. Oh, so I read that wrong. Well, but I like my plans. All things are going to work together for good. God's for me, right? He's on my team. Is God on, on anyone's team? Not really. We get on his team. And if we, if we have, uh, if we read that verse wrong, why isn't everything working together for good for me? I, I got my plans and he still not, did he not hear my prayer when I said I wanted to do this and this and I'm going to do there, I'm going to go on this trip and, 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 and I'm going to go and accomplish this and this and this. And the Lord... We forgot the scripture verse that says, don't say I'm going to go here and there and do this and that. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. It says, uh, rather start saying, if the Lord wills, I'm going to go do this and this. That acknowledges that God's plans might be different than your own. And if you have that deep understanding and are prepared, when things go south on you, you won't throw your hands up in the air. Uh, and Andy and Kramer, come on up here. You went on a trip. Now, a marvelous adventure. And they, they had plans. They were going to go do something. But rather than me tell them, they told me what happened. I thought it was 
bore repeating, but rather than me keep talking, Andy and Kramer. We took off on a uh, road truck last, uh, last weekend. We were gone, went down through Kentucky and stuff. And our original plan was just going down to help with a car project. But we got that done soon enough, and so we did a little looking at the map and decided that somewhere out in the direction of uh, Pittsburgh was kind of a good route, and we would just go trek out through the mountains. And uh, we were driving my 26-year-old Volkswagen that I drank out of the scrapyard two months ago. <clears throat> so nice. Sounds like a plan. Up-to-date automotive equipment here. And uh, as we were cruising down the road, we had a few little hiccups along the way, tires that were out of balance and the car doing funny shaking stuff. But we'd finally got all that fixed after two stops. And uh, we were discussing how nice the car was driving and everything was going great and the places we were going to go and the things we were going to see. And it was at night, driving in the rain. And all of a sudden we start having... I look down and I see that my fuel gauge that had been reading half a tank is now aimed at the red... And I had a momentary heart attack, so I'm like, oh my goodness, we just blew a fuel line and dumped all our fuel out, and we're out in the boonies in the mountains in the western end of Kentucky. And uh, then I realized, no, no, no emergency. My temperature gauge is reading way down on cold, too. And I said, hey, look at that, Kramer. These things are reading wonky. It's just, you know, Volkswagen electronics. They're goofy. And so about then, what you say? I think it was the headlights. Kramer says, uh, um, Kramer says, you think your headlights are a little dim? I says, you know, maybe. He says, and look at your windshield wiper blades. They're doing this, and then, and it's kind of like, that can't be good. And then as I'm watching, I mean, this is all in the span of about two miles. We're discussing this, cruising down the highway. I see my ga gauge backlights start dimming. It's just like dying. Now the engine's running, so it's a diesel engine, doesn't take much power, but we sure aren't having much of anything else happening. So as we're discussing this, trying to figure out what's going on, all of a sudden here's an exit. So we wheel it off the exit quick and uh, pull into a gas station here, jump out, get a voltmeter, sure enough, alternator's not charging and everything is rapidly running out of power. We're down and of course you guys volts. are getting very upset because your plans well, are being thwarted, right? It's funny because we'd been discussing that throughout the day. We'd stopped twice before for funny wobbles and we had discussed how there were two ways to deal with this. We could either get upset or realize that you know what this was all part of the adventure and that somehow this all fit into some grand plan and so as we're standing there even at the gas station we're discussing this a little and going you know as bad as getting stranded in some podunky little town in the east end of Kentucky is this there's got to be some purpose to this. so we actually had decided we were going to enjoy it and it was just going to be part of the adventure however it worked out and so we wound up tracking around town, and nobody had an alternator. Nobody could get an alternator for about two days. So we ended up getting a hotel room, and we'd looked around. There was a hotel, an Applebee's, and a theater all within walking distance of each other. And we'd got our battery charged up at the parts store, and we decided we'd take off the next morning when we didn't need, hopefully, windshield wiper blades or headlights running, and we'd just run without the alternator. Because I'd probably run for a week with that car without the alternator working if I didn't have to run accessories. So... Yeah, we were push starting it everywhere we'd go. That was the other sweet thing. Go to the parts store. And we'd go in, check for some parts, push start it, go over to get our uh, hotel the push, room. He was the start. <laughs> <laughs> He's good at that. Pop the clutch and away we'd go. <clears throat> the beauty of 26 year old cars. So we, uh, we ended up checking into our hotel room and we're sitting there. It's just like, you know, we really don't feel like a movie anymore. And I was just feeling like vegetating. So we took a shower and I'm all settled in for the evening. And Kramer here says, we're going to go get something to eat. And I says, you really want to do that? I'm just feeling like sitting in this chair. No, nope, we're getting something to eat. So we went out, push started the car again, <laughs> drove over to Applebee's. We go in there and we're uh, sitting in Applebee's and waitress comes out and starts getting our food. And we end up, I don't remember, it was a series of discussions, questions. We, everybody down there for some reason could tell we weren't from there. <laughs> we could tell they weren't from Michigan for sure. We were getting honeyed, sugared, sweetied, and uh, what were all the baby dolled, all these other terms that I never hear waitresses use on customers in Michigan. <laughs> and so invariably people would ask us where we were from. And so we told her and then uh, she wanted to know how we knew each other. And Michael mentioned that we were, you know, we'd met through a Bible study. And she says, oh, you're Christians. I'm a Christian too. And then uh, it had come out that she was married. Michael's actually more conversant in these type of situations than I am. I sit there making smart remarks and he makes intelligent ones. So <laughs> he, was, 
he asked her, well, do you have any kids? And yeah, she says, I think I got another one on the way, but I'm not sure what to think of that because my husband and I just got back together. And then she kind of stops. She says, you know what? I'm probably never going to see you again, so I might as well share this with you. And she actually sat down there for probably 20 minutes, shares how her and her husband had got separated and her concerns about his faith and her faith and ended up dragging a Bible out. I have one of those in my pocket, this one. And uh, so we sat down and uh, ended up talking with her and seemed to really encourage her. And then she uh, asked, you know, she says, if you guys think of it, you know, after you've lived here, would you mind praying for me? And we said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're praying now. That was a Calvinism coming out. It's something he's pounded into us. You don't wait to pray. So we ended up praying for her and she was very touched. And I did another thing I thought I wouldn't ever do, by the way, and that was... Uh, Kelvin, you know, when we go out to eat, he's constantly, like, talking to strangers. And then he'll snag them, get talking to them, go, Oh, by the way, I preached this really awesome sermon two weeks ago. You should go check it out. And I'm always I didn't just like, say awesome sermon. I said I preached a sermon that's relevant. <laughs> now, what did he just tell you about other ways of communicating other than words? He goes, I just preached this sermon a couple of weeks ago, and you should check it out. <laughs> he's got that look on his face that says it's an awesome sermon. He doesn't need words for that. <laughs> and so... <laughs> he, uh, so I had always thought that was a little weird and so we're sitting there and the week before I'd preached here and as we're talking to her I'm thinking that's really a message she needs to hear and so I swallowed my pride and said you know I preached a sermon about a week ago that might help you <laughs> and she says oh so she's all excited gets pen and paper out so she can get the website for GCF down and, but as we left there it was just no doubt. We're looking at each other going, this is crazy. We're cruising down the highway. Everything's going great. And God reached out his finger and said, I think that car's going to stop right there. <laughs> and this series of events, Kramer said, you know what would be crazy is if we get up in the morning and that car works. We got up the next morning. I popped the hood. I'm poking around under there. I thought, ah, the belt seems a little loose. And I had a new belt, so I slapped a new belt on, which really wouldn't do much of anything. And I thought, man, I really should wait for Kramer to push start this, but I'm going to waste some battery power. And I fired it up, warning light went out, and I climb around there in the hood, voltmeter, and it works flawlessly. I drove it here this morning. It's worked without a hitch ever since. <laughs> so this was an, in, an important appointment that God orchestrated, and you could have been disappointed, but God had an appointment. Just change one letter. This poem says it well. Disappointment. His appointment change one letter and I see that the thwarting of my purpose is God's better choice for me. His appointment must be blessing, though it may come in disguise, but for the end from the beginning, open to his wisdom lies. Disappointment, his appointment, who's the Lord who loves best, understands and knows me fully, who my faith and love would test. For like loving earthly parents, he rejoices when he knows that his child accepts unquestioned all that from his wisdom flows. Disappointment, his appointment. No good thing will he withhold. From denials oft we gather treasures from his love untold. Well he knows each broken purpose leads to fuller, deeper trust. And the end of all his dealing proves our God is wise and just. Disappointment, his appointment. Lord, I take it then as such. Like the clay in hands of potter, yielding wholly to thy touch, all my life's plan is thy molding. Not one single choice be mine. Let me answer unrepining. Father, not my will, but thine. I'm thankful because God has a plan and I trust him. I found there he's much better and wiser than I am. Uh, it says in Proverbs 16 verse 9, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his step. I challenge all of you, my brothers and sisters today, to get in touch with the wellspring, the head spring, the headwaters, of God and know that there is joy and peace and contentment and thankfulness when we trust that he knows what's best for us 
I'm thankful and joyful because my soul is satisfied by God himself. The headwaters of my thankfulness. My expectations. That's okay if, if I, they don't get met in my time. His plans are best. The source of my joy is in him. And let's, we end with this scripture verse. Psalm 87 verse 7. All of my springs of joy are in you, God. Why don't we stand up? As we've considered and examined our heart today to see whether we are living based on expectations we have and our joy and hope and our thankfulness is tied to us meeting our plans. If we found that that is the case, repentance is necessary. A refocusing, a re-acknowledging that God is your source of life. And I want us to bow our heads right now. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand, but I want you to be honest with God in your heart. God wants the blessing of gratefulness to be pouring through you to others. It blesses his heart when you are sincere in your thankfulness and gratefulness. He has plans for you, and they will require interrupting your plans. He wants to use you, but you need to believe God's way is better than anything you could think of. So I want you in your heart right now to say, God, I'm sorry for the time that I have claimed my own way and been resistant to the changes. I submit myself to you, Lord. I invite you to use me as you will. I ask this in Jesus' name, and I believe, Lord, that you are not only going to forgive me of my sins, Lord, and, but you're going to refocus me and connect me to the headwaters of thankfulness, which is God himself. I ask this in Jesus' name.